Well, tonight we're going to explore this controversial topic called the rapture. And I'm fond of calling it some, on certain occasions as the most preposterous belief in biblical Christianity. Most of us probably in this audience uh, uh, are familiar with the rapture and hold to that view, and yet we need to recognize, I think, at least acknowledge in our own minds, that it's a wild idea, strange idea, that in some, at some indeterminate moment, Christ's believers will be caught up, snatched up, out of this world, while the world goes on with a very, very definite agenda. And a uh, very strange idea. And uh, we're going to do this in two sessions. The first session, we're going to explore what's called the Blessed Hope. And the second session, we'll get into some of the background, and I'm going to call it that pattern is prologue. If we understand the patterns that God deals with, it's very, very helpful. We'll look at strategic structure in the scriptures. But the word rapture, some people say it's not in your Bible. Well, actually it is, but we'll come to that. The Greek term where it appears is called the harpazo. And the harpazo, it's, uh, it's, we're going to deal with it in the first session. We're going to talk about God's promise, the process, and the purpose. And then we'll talk in the second session, the prophetic profile, where it fits in, the problems that are associated with it, and then finally a proposal. So the first session will be the first three, the blessed hope, and the second session will be the final three, the prophetic profile, the problems, and the proposal. So I'm fond of quoting Dr. Richard Feynman, Caltech. When speaking of quantum physics, he made a very interesting remark. He, says, he said, I think it's safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. In fact, it is often stated of all the theories proposed in this, session, in this century, the silliest is quantum theory. Some say that the only thing quantum theory has going for it, in fact, is that it is unquestionably correct. Very often quoted, quote, by Feynman of the, the current state of quantum physics, but I feel it echoes the same kind of attitude towards the rapture, because it sounds so preposterous on the one hand, but the only thing that it's got going for it is the more you study your Bible, the more you take it seriously, and I'm talking about the whole Bible as an, as an integral whole, the more it's clear that it is uh, an essential ingredient in God's program. So let's take a look at it. Let's start with the promise. If you have a Bible, I'm going to encourage you to turn to John 14. And as we do so, let's remember the context. This is that last night. They would go from there to Gethsemane and, the, and the, all the episodes through the night and the following day and the climax in the, crucif in the crucifixion. Jesus has just finished dipping the sop and announcing that he was be going to be betrayed. Judas, thus identified, has left. And something worth understanding is that the timing was controlled by Jesus Christ. The one thing that they did not want to do is take him on a feast day, certainly not on Passover. If you study there, Matthew 26 and so forth, the, the background. But Jesus let the cat out of the bag himself. And he announced to Judas that Judas is going to betray him, which forced Judas to fish or cut bait. If he's going to do it, he had to do it that night. So he takes off to make the arrangements. But what's left in the room then are the, the 11, the believing disciples. Judas is gone. And Jesus makes, announces a fascinating promise. The first verse in the ch chapter says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. Just four days ago, Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem and was proclaimed the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King, on the exact day that Daniel had previously predicted, or I should say that Gabriel told Daniel, five centuries ago. But he's announcing disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. That's a, a, let's just recognize how audacious that statement is. Angels were not to be worshipped, but he's putting himself quite apart from that. There are four possibilities. He either was God or wasn't, either knew or didn't know accordingly. Now, if he, was God, if he wasn't God and didn't know it, we'd have him condemned as a lunatic. We're indebted to C.S. Lewis for this simplification, but it certainly makes sense. If he, if he wasn't God and knew that he wasn't, then he's a liar. He should be stoned. Obviously, if he was God, he knew. But if he was God and knew that he was God, we call him Lord. And that's what this is all about. He's going to, because that's all true, he's going to announce his program. In the next verse, he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare 
a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Fabulous, fabulous commitment. Jesus also will make mention before the evening's over that it's essential that he leaves so that the Holy Spirit can come, so that the Comforter can come. For some reason undisclosed, they seem to be mutually exclusive. Jesus would have to leave before the Comforter could be given. And it's going to be interesting that we'll see that reversal occur before he returns. That the Comforter, in the sense that he indwells, will be withdrawn and he will come. But the main thing to notice here, we say, Father, so many mansions, you know, we tend to, to uh, visualize heaven probably as a street with buildings because we think of cities. But um, the, the idiom here, at least, is that we actually will have a, a specially tailored environment within heaven, within, within the Father's house. And he goes there to prepare a place. It's irresistible to, to not notice that God created this universe in six days. And we only know the universe after the curse. And even after the curse, it's breathtaking to rediscover this universe. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. And he's been at it how long? A couple thousand years. I suspect it's going to be rather mag magnificent. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also, and from that time on, will always be with him. Now, I want you to notice the frequency of you in these verses. For not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Who's the focus here? You are. And the disciples, of course, and by extension ourselves. There's a background piece that you and I are um, uh, absent of, and that is a Jewish wedding, especially the ancient Jewish wedding. You and I are familiar with a wedding f uh, uh, approach or formula or ritual that's quite distant from the, the ancient Jewish wedding after which the Bible is patterned. It opens with a ketubah, the betrothal, the commitment. The, generally, on the part of the, uh, the uh, prospective bridegroom, he took the initiative, and they established a marriage covenant. And uh, the negotiating price, the mohair, was uh, uh, he had to pay to purchase for his, for his bride. And uh, once that was done, from that point on, she was set aside. She was, she was sanctified, in a sense, set, aside, set apart. Uh, from that moment on, uh, 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 she was considered exclusively for the bridegroom. It was an enforceable contract. Remember Joseph and Mary. They were espoused, and yet he had that problem because it, even though it was just an espousal, he was committed. It was a, it was a, it, it, uh, it was a committed situation in, um, in Matthew 1 and also in Malachi 2 and so forth. So, um, and as a symbol of that relationship, they would both drink wine as a sealing that. So that, uh, that led to the next step. And this is, you'll find this all through the scripture in Judges uh, 14, 10, and 11, all the way through. Uh, but let's go on to the next part. When, after that happens, the bridegroom would depart to his father's house. And he would prepare typically a room addition that would, be, uh, would take some time for him to construct and arrange for. Meanwhile, sheep would prepare for his imminent return. This is a very interesting concept that we need to embrace and understand because it's re referred to all through the scripture. And that is that the bridegroom, they're committed, but they're not married yet. And the bridegroom is absent. And he, how long he'll be gone is deliberately indeterminate. She does not know when he's going to return. It, that's what we mean by eminence. There was no preconditioned event that would, that would have to take place before he could return. And when he finally did return, there was a surprise gathering, usually at night, often at midnight. And he would, uh, he would uh, uh, sometimes be gone, say maybe for a year, while he, he added a room to his father's house. And that would you know, give her, of course, a chance to get her trousseau together and get prepared for married life. And uh, so he would, uh, at the end of this separation, he would come to take his bride with him. The groom, the best man, other male attendants would uh, leave the father's house, conduct a torchlight procession typically to the home of the bride. And although the, although the bride was expecting her groom to come, she didn't know when. And so as a result, the groom's arrival was typically preceded by a shout. 
and which, was, uh, which forewarned the bride to be prepared for his coming. In the notes that accompany this, uh, we'll have all the footnotes and the authorities for all these things. But that then leads to the, the, uh, the uh, hoopah. Oh, I might mention, by the way, in the surprise gathering, that is even memorialized in Matthew 25 by Jesus when he talks about the ten, famous ten virgins. Understand that parable, the context of it. They're waiting for the surprise of the bridegroom coming. You find that all through the scriptures, if you know where to look, Psalm 45 and so on. But anyway, the hoopah then, that leads to the, the wedding proper. And uh, they, would, uh, they would be escorted by the members of the wedding party to the bridal chamber. Originally a hoopah, now just memorialized with a little canopy. But in the original days, it was a separate chamber. And prior to, prior to entering the chamber, the bride remained veiled so that no one could see her face. While the groomsmen and the bridesmaid waited outside, the bride and groom entered the bridal chamber alone. There in the privacy of that place, they entered into the physical union for the first time that consummated the marriage and uh, that uh, was covenant pr presumably maybe a, a year earlier. And after it was consummated, the groom would come out of the bridal chamber, announce that the consummation of the marriage to the members of the wedding party and uh, uh, then the guests and so forth, the, the wedding party would announce it to the guests and so forth. And that leads, of course, to the marriage supper lasted typically seven days. You'll find that in a number of places, uh, Judges 14, Matthew 9, uh, Matthew 22, again, we have it used as an idiom in, in the parables and so forth. So um, they had a great wedding feast. So, um, and, uh, and, and after the uh, seven days, the bride would be unveiled and everyone could see her face and so forth. So that's it. Now what's interesting, this marriage model is not only in the scriptures and in other authorities, it's fulfilled in the idiom of the church in the scripture. The covenant was established, 1 Corinthians 11.25 deals with that. The purchase price was nothing other than the blood of Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 is, goes through that. In fact, that's what we usually do when we take communion is to commemorate that. The bride then was set apart. You want to really read carefully Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, where we have instructions, where Paul tells you know, that wives submit to your husbands and so forth. And he goes through that whole thing, and then he even quotes Genesis 2.24, for this cause shall man leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife, the two shall be one flesh. He quotes that in the context of the bride of, 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 the bride of Christ and Christ himself, he, Christ in the church. The very next verse after he quotes that, he says, but I, just about the time you get there, you think he's, what Paul is talking about is the marriage relationship. But then he throws your curveball. He says, I speak of Christ in the church. He's expressing this model. And we're reminded of the first covenant in 1 Corinthians 11. The bridegroom presently has left for the father's house. That's where he's been for this interval period of time. And there will be an escort to accompany him upon his return to gather his bride. And we'll see that in 1 Thessalonians 4 shortly. So that leads us then to the process. We understand that he's going to gather his bride. How is he going to do that? You know, it's interesting to me to realize that without any scripture... You know the rapture has to take place because there is a point at which all the believers are going to receive resurrection bodies and be with the Lord. Well, whenever that happens, there's going to be some believers that haven't died yet. So they are going to be changed along with the bodies being resurrected. So that's all we mean by the rapture. Well, this could be described here in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's, it, but let's, before we get into you know, this whole idea of the resurrection body isn't just a New Testament idea. It's all through the Bible. In fact, the oldest book of the Bible, Job 19, quotes, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at that latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. And mine eye shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. An incredible declaration of his conviction of the res resurrection of the body. But uh, in the Thessalonian church, Paul was there for about three weeks, founded this church, and uh, shortly after he left, he found out that they were, get they were getting very upset because some of their friends had died. A grandma here, a mother there, whatever, and some of their, in the believing community, some of them had died, and they were disturbed because they felt Apparently, that they were that, that, that those that had died had somehow left been left out of something. It's interesting that they had that much consciousness of the the eminent return. But then Paul writes him a letter in First Thessalonians chapter four. He says, "I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, which is a euphemism for those that passed on, 
that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So he's talking about the believing dead here, right? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. Okay, so when he, when he comes back, he's going to have them with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. Really? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So this is the place where the word rapture occurs. The word caught up in the Greek is harpazo. And it's interesting to know, we don't, often the quotes end up with verse 17. I think verse 18 is part of this passage. It says, wherefore, we comfort one another with these words. There are people that believe that the rapture will occur after the uh, great tribulation. And that puts the Lord in this, this kind of, this puts the bridegroom in this kind of a program. Come, we're going to get married. Then I'm going to beat the living daylights out of you. And then we'll go have dinner. <laughs> Comfort your another with these words. You say, the word rapture does not appear in your Bible. It does if you're reading the Latin Bible. In the Vulgate, this is the, this is the Latin Vulgate. The word is rapimir which is, it's the proper tense of rapio, which is uh, our English words rapt and rapture come from the past participle of rapio. So it's derived from that verb. So the word rapture occurs in effect in its proper tense in Latin, in the Latin Bible, in the Vulgate. That's where we get this term. Every, people who say it's rapture is not the Bible, they haven't done their homework. There are actually, surprisingly enough, seven raptures in the scripture. Enoch, you could call, was raptured back in Genesis 5. So designated in Hebrews 11. Elijah was taken in 2 Kings 2. Jesus, of course, is the classic example. And uh, Philip in Acts 8, verse 39. Paul, when he's taken to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12. These are all familiar passages. And the body of Christ is spoken here in 1 Thessalonians 4. And there's one more when John is called up in the first verse of Revelation chapter 4. In fact, what's interesting is for these, the actual word harpazo is used. And probably the most provocative one of all of these, to me, is Revelation 12, 5. And uh, in Revelation 12, we have Israel portrayed as the woman. The woman that really, in a sense, starts with Eve. It's the woman that gave birth to the man-child, the Messiah. She brought forth a man-child. And some people try to make that the church. In Revelation 12, that's again a, a strange contrivance because clearly it's identified by its idioms there drawn from Genesis. Jacob in Genesis actually identifies her, her for you. But furthermore, she's the one that brought forth the man-child. She's the mother. She's not the wife or the bride. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. Who would that be? Jesus Christ. Psalm 110, several places. Okay. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. When I, whenever I read that as a kid, I always presumed what that's referring to is the ascension. And it may well be. But I believe it was G.H. Pember who first recognized the possibility that what may be in view here is the catching up of the body of Christ, the church itself. In fact, the word there for caught up, interesting enough, is harpazo, the same word that we have in 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay, so that's the process. What's the purpose of all this? What's going on? Well, 1 Corinthians 15 deals with this for us. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So that's our problem. If we're saved, yes, but we're still in flesh. Flesh cannot inherit. The... So there's got to be a transition. For those that have died, it's at the resurrection. The resurrection, you know, so many people are bewildered about the technology of the rapture. That's got to be easier than reaching down and getting someone's decomposed in a coffin. You know. But you know, interestingly enough, but right before I leave that topic, uh, we, we're indebted to uh, Michael Crichton for giving us a, a demonstration of what the technology would be to be required to do, to do this.
because in his, his, fam his classic novel about Jurassic Park, these prehistoric creatures are created with nothing more than a piece of information. It happens to be the DNA that was captured, and they have a, a mechanism for the plot that does that. But it's interesting, you, if you realize what's going on there, it's a demonstration of how you could create a prehistoric creature from nothing more than a piece of information. All God needs to resurrect you is a, your DNA, and maybe a little bit more, but a piece of information. Because the particular atoms he might choose to use are fungible elements anyway to assemble and put together. And I suspect that if, if pretty, with pretty co some confidence that we're not necessarily going to be built out of hydrocarbon mo molecules in a resurrection body. In fact, there's some surprises coming. We'll come to that. But the point is, the main point is that this transition has to take place. And 1 Corinthians 15 is the chapter that really deals with the whole issue of resurrection. I could argue, I think Paul would argue, that it's probably the most important chapter in the Bible. Because without 1 Corinthians 15, we have nothing. It's the key to it all. But uh, in verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, a mystery in the Greek, the, mystery, the word means something up till now has been hidden, I'm now revealing. They use the term mystery a little differently than we use it. It's more like revealing a password kind of thing. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Notice the we there, by the way. Paul identified himself in this category in some surprising ways, especially even in the second letter we'll come to. We shall not all sleep, we shall, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So this is the transition that's taking place, and this twinkling of an eye, by the way, that's not a blink. A blink's a long period of time. I personally suspect, that's a conjecture on my part, that that's going to be about 10 to the minus 43 seconds, because that's the digital limit. <laughs> One of the things that we know from today, and I'm not being facetious, I know it's, you know, I usually am, but that's, we live in a digital simulation. One of the great discoveries of quantum physics is that length, mass, energy, time, almost anything we can uh, 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 engage in this universe is, is composed of individ, uh, undividable, indivisible units. You would think that length, no matter what you have, you can cut it in half, and whatever you've got left, you can cut in half again. You can do that forever, at least conceptually. No, you can't. Get down to 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, if you try to split that in half, it no longer has locality. It becomes immediately connected to everything else in the universe. The proving of non-locality by uh, Alan Aspect and those guys back in 1982 shocked the physics world. And the mac on the macrocosm, the universe is finite. That's a big discovery of 20th century science. On the microcosm, the, 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 whether it's mass, time, whatever, it's made up of indiv indivisible units. The smallest unit of time is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Smaller than that does not exist. It's digital. And that's profoundly significant. The point is, that's why I suspect that's probably the unit of time, because the twinkling of an eye was a... See, it's the, it's the, sp at the speed of light. How long does it take you to go through the... Iris, about that. So um, anyway, uh, let's move on. The climax then is, the uh, next verse he says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now, the physics of immortality, we've had some we have a briefing pack on that, so if I want to just extract a couple of things you might find interesting. The first thing that fascinates me is the dimensionality issue. We know that Jesus Christ, in his physical body along the Sea of Galilee, he was a three-dimensional body. He could handle him, see, he ate, and, you know, he, he, was, he was familiar. But we also know that after his resurrection, he, in, he uh, had some very unusual properties. He could enter and leave a room without passing through the walls, floor, or ceiling. We think of a cube as having six sides, but he could enter and leave without passing through any of those six sides. Now, if you're a mathematician, you can deal with this because we're dealing with hyperspaces. There's only two kinds of people who can deal with hyperspaces. That's mathematicians with special training and small children. But you and I probably have difficulty with that. Where this comes up, see, some people speculate that Jesus people who are expert in this area tend to conjecture that Jesus had to have at least 11 dimensions in order to accomplish what he accomplishes. 
Now, you know, I can't relate that without some mathematics. I won't get into that here. But the point is we need to understand we're dealing here in spaces of more than the, the, the three dimensions. And 1 John 3, 2 has a fascinating verse. In 1 John 3, 2, he writes, uh, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, that sounds like double talk at first, and yet what he's saying in effect, see, you and I, when we look at, say, a, a set of drawings for a house, we look at a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional house. You know, and when you look at a painting, that's an artist's two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional space. What he's saying, see, what he's really saying here, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're not going to see a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional being or a, a five-dimensional representation of a six-dimensional being. Whatever it is, we'll be like him because we're going to see him as he is. See, the only way you can get a three-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional person is to be a three-dimensional person with him. You follow me? That's what he's saying. So whatever he is, whatever it is, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. When will we do that? When he shall appear. That's exciting. That's exciting. Now, in 2 Corinthians 5, there's a passage that's often overlooked by people who are in this rapture issue that um, came up in our studies when we were investigating Genesis 6, and I'm indebted to Tommy Ice's recent uh, newsletter who to highlight something else. So we've got something to trade here, kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, first verse says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Now, it's in the Greek that this has some subtleties we want to be sensitive to. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, he's using here the idiom of a tent for our temporary dwellings. Why? Because a tent is typically considered a temporary dwelling for camping or whatever. You and I are in our temporary dwellings that, that serves us for a period of, what, three score and ten or whatever. We know that if our earthly house of this tent were dissolved, we have a building of God, a building of God. He's, he's shifting to a, a, a more permanent idiom here. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You know, one thing, let me just insert this too. You know, most of us tend to think of this as, you know, look at this podium or the, our, our physical universe as being real. And we tend to think of the spiritual universe as the, sort of ephemeral, invisible, sort of a, a fuzzy never, never land kind of thing. It's the other way around. This podium is a simulation it's an electrical simulation. It only feels solid. There's more space than solid here if you really understand the atomic structure. It's the real universe that's real. This is a simulation of sorts. But anyway, he goes on then. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now, the word house here is an interesting word. In the Greek, it's oketerian. And it's interesting because it only occurs twice in the Bible. Once here, as referring to that which we aspire to in our resurrection bodies. The only other place it shows up is in Jude 6. And there, <laughs> it's a strange illusion. In Jude 6, he's talking about the bizarre goings-on of Genesis 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, hath he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness into the unto the judgment of the great day. He's referring to the judgment of those angels that generated the Nephilim in Genesis 6. And what's interesting is this first estate, the word is arche, which is, uh, means principality or magistry of either angels or demons. They left that. They, could, they kept not their first estate, but they left their own habitation. The word habitation there again is oketerian, this dwelling that they disrobed themselves of to engage in this mischief in Genesis 6. It's the same word that describes that body that we aspire to in our resurrection bodies that will be instantly uh, given to us uh, at the rapture. In fact, see the next verse. It's interesting. Paul reveals something here in the third verse of 2 Corinthians 5. He says, um, picking up the, let me take verse 2 first. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. What on earth is he talking about? 
You see, when someone dies, their body, of course, goes in the ground or whatever. What happens to their spirit? Anyone? They're with the Lord immediately in the spirit. They don't have their bodies yet. When do they get their bodies? At the resurrection. Paul talks, uses that phrase naked as being with the Lord, but not with his body until the resurrection. And what he is revealing here, interestingly enough, is his desire, his hope, that he could be raptured so that, he's, uh, that he will be uh, not naked for that interval, whatever that interval is. And to be closed upon in verse 2 is uh, ependomai. It comes from epi and in duo. Uh, it means to put on over, put one piece of clothing over another presently being worn. So it's Paul's aspiration that he could be raptured because then he is, the whole thing takes place at once. Because what was in view here was the idea that he, the spirit would be with the Lord for some interval from the time he died until, he, until the resurrection takes place. Now, what betrays that is the possibility that the whole time dimensionality will be different on that side of the issue, but that's another briefing back another time. We talked about the Jewish wedding, the ketubah, the betrothal, payment of the purchase price, the bride set apart, the bridegroom departs to his father's house, prepares the room addition, and the bride then prepares for his return, which is imminent, could happen any time. And this leads to a very fundamental teaching in the New Testament, we call the doctrine of imminence. And... Uh, what it simply means is that there's nothing that need precede it. Doesn't mean it'll happen tomorrow, but it could happen tomorrow or next week or anything. It, there's no precedent requirement. If it's eminent, it means it could be right now. The word eminent, it's the next expectation. The next event in God's program is for the bride to be gathered by the bridegroom. There are all kinds of other things that'll happen subsequently, but that's the next thing to happen. An next expectation. There's no precedent condition. Now, don't confuse this with eminent, it's spelled with an A, eminent, that, uh, that's, that, mean, that, that means that God is not only transcendent or far above us, but he's always with us and active on our behalf. So that term in theology has another meaning, a different spelling. Nor should it be confused with eminent, which is a title of honor reserved with persons of outstanding distinction. So there's three different words that get confused. Eminent with an I, I-M-M-I-N-A-T, meaning Next expectation, nothing, nothing, nothing need precede it. Believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. That's all through the New Testament. Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, Hebrews 9.28, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, 5, Revelation 22, and so on. Clearly, you cannot get through the New Testament without a consciousness that the believers were to conduct their lives in a moment-by-moment -moment expectancy of the return of the Savior. That whole concept is eminency. If you understand that, that, that concept, you'll discover many theories that are floating around the landscape would violate that. If there are precedent conditions, then, uh, uh, they, then that, that punctures the doctrine of eminency. And the, the First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10 is the best example. It expresses the hope and warmth of, of expectancy. And it should result in a victorious and purified life. People who are living with that expectancy are minding their knitting. They're, 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 they're living their lives in a literal expectation that the Lord could come at any moment. The minute you start letting go of that is when you, you'll find you start slipping. It's a very, very purifying doctrine. Now, by the way, Paul did seem to include himself among those who looked for Christ's return. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2, also the, uh, 2 Thessalonians 5 we just looked at. Timothy was admonished by Paul to keep his, this commandment without spot or rebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the Jewish converts were reminded that yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not tarry, Hebrews 10. You, there are many of these. In fact, the Lord's instruction on the other side is to occupy till I come. And uh, see, the expectation of some were so strong that they'd stop work. They got, you know, the Lord's, the Lord's coming next Tuesday, let's relax. And uh, so they had to be exhorted to return to their jobs in 2 Thessalonians 3 and to have patience, James 5.8. In other words, there was such an expectation, they were sort of overreacting to that and uh, putting their feet on the desk, you know. And that's tragic because that's also a legitimate criticism of people who embrace the doctrine I'm talking about, the, the pre-trib rapture. 
some of the people who don't hold that view can be critical of us because they, that uh, there's a tendency of, of us not to roll up our sleeves and recognize there's things that need to be done in the meantime. So there's two extreme problems. One problem is the rap what I call rapturitis, rapture paralysis, you might call it. And the other one is the rapture mania, the date setters. And uh, both, those are both extremes at the opposite ends. Rapturitis, that's a uniquely American dementia, I believe. When I travel abroad, I don't find as much as here. But the, here in America, it's amazing how many people who believe in the rapture, pre-trib rapture, just because the church, I think you can show from the scripture, and we'll get into that in the next session, will not go through the Great Tribulation. Why should we escape what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the past 2,000 years has had to endure? It's called persecution. Church was promised persecution. And, uh, and you can call that persecution tribulation. It's troubled times. It's not the great tribulation as definitively, definitively described. It's tribulation that comes from where? Where does the church get persecuted? From the world and from Satan. The great tribulation has its source as the wrath of God. That's a different thing altogether. We are promised not to experience the wrath of God. We may experience all kinds of correction. We may endure all kinds of persecution. Indeed, that's not the great tribulation. We'll come to that. And there's an attitude that somehow, especially here in America, that Christians are not going to have any problems. We could be facing very dark times. Where do we get the audacity, the arrogance, to assume that we're going to escape what most of the body of Christ and most of the world for most of the last 1900 years had to endure? It's called persecution. And uh, Now the other side of the coin is the date setters. Boy, there's a long history of these. I won't take you through them all. But you can go through almost every segment of history. We've had uh, well, Jacobo Flores in the, in the 13th century. A uh, bunch of them all the way through, uh, even to uh, recent times, William Miller in 1843, and then again on October in, in 1844, and then uh, C.T. Russell in 1874. Most of us remember E.C. Uh, e. Wisenant's books, 88 Reasons for 1988. Those books are a collector's item, huh? Uh, Harold Camping in September of 1994, he had that nailed. And of course, with the 2000, now we're in a new thousand, you know, a whole new cycle. There's a whole new cycle of people with charts and diagrams explaining jubilee years, whatever, and, and uh, let's take a quick look at the scripture. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. In fact, the Mark reference of that same thing says, not the Son, but the Father only. Interesting passage. Matthew 24, 42, watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. Matthew 24, 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. There again, it's not date said, but notice again the eminence that's there. Be ready. Because you don't know when he's going to, he, could, he can arrive at any moment. So don't set dates. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. I believe the reason this thing is not clear is because God is going to catch Satan by surprise. That's part of the strategy, I believe. Personal conjecture. Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Luke 12, 40. Acts 1, 7. He said unto them, it is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, the thing you discover as you get into this topic in depth, you start collecting the verses that seem to refer to what I'll call the second coming of Jesus Christ. For every, most of you realize that there's, when in his first coming, there were over 300 prophecies that were specifically fulfilled in his first coming. What you may not realize is that for every one of those, there are eight prophecies of a second coming. There's over 2,500 specific details of a second coming. So as you go through your Bible study, you start collecting those, and as you start collecting those and examining them, you'll discover, you'll discover something rather strange. You'll discover that there's a cluster of them that have a lot in common. And I'm going to call those, for lack of a better term, the second coming. His return in power to set up his kingdom. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 12, Zechariah, all through the New Testament, on it goes, Revelation, so on. And there's a whole list. I won't go through each one of these individually. They'll be in your notes for those who want to track them down. We're going to compare them another way. But there's, there's one group that have a certain set of characteristics in common, and a couple of dozen of those. There's another group that I'll call the rapture passages that are quite different. In fact, you discover they're contradictory. In one case, you don't know when he's coming. The other one, you're going to know exactly when he's coming. In one case, he comes in secret for his own. The other one, every eye shall see him. You begin to realize, wait a minute. As you study these two clusters of a couple of dozen references in each bucket, 
you begin to realize this has to be talking about two different things. And indeed it does. The second coming of Christ in the broad sense is it comes in two phases. Once for the church, once for Israel. Once for the church to fulfill his promises to his bride. And secondly, he comes in power to fulfill all the commitments that God has laid down in both the Old and New Testaments for a kingdom on the earth where he'll take David's throne, etc. And uh, very, very interesting times. Two events. Let's contrast these a different way, by function rather than by reference. In one case, the rapture, there's a translation of all the believers. In the second coming, there's no translation involved. He comes into the earth and sets up his kingdom on the earth, and there's people that live in the earth. They have children. They have, you go in the millennium, there's going to be people that die. It's a different kind of, you know, it's different in some respects, and yet it's not, it's not eternity yet. That comes at the end of the thousand years. In the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven. In the second coming, translated saints return to the earth with him. Different deal. It's, a different, it's in a different lane of traffic, if I may. In the rapture, the earth isn't judged. He doesn't come to the earth. He gathers, meets us in the air. The judgment comes later, the second coming. The earth's judged. Here's perhaps the most important distinction between these two groups of prophecies. In the one case, they're imminent at any moment, and they're signless. There's no sign that needs to precede the rapture, other than the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. I and mean, that's like now. There isn't a precedent set of conditions you can see coming. For the second coming, there is the most documented period of time in the entire Bible. A seven-year history that has more information about it than any other period of time in the Bible. It precedes the second coming. If that starts, you can set, almost set the date. In fact, there's a mid-course correction. Make sure you're on track. They say the rapture is not in the Old Testament. I don't happen to believe that. I'll show you why. But that's the standard dictum. And of course, second coming is all predicted throughout the Old Testament. Rapture is the believers only. Second coming affects all men on earth. The rapture occurs before the day of wrath is so promised. And the second coming concludes the day of wrath. So rapture has no reference to Satan. He's not a player. In fact, his whole thing, I think, is geared to get him by surprise. Second coming, Satan's bound. When the rapture occurs, that's like a starting gun for Satan because he knows he's got a little bit, of, only a little time. That's part of the game that's going on. The rapture, Jesus comes for his own. Second coming, he comes with his own. That's what the references say in many places. Rapture comes in the air. The, the second coming, he comes to the earth. Rapture, he claims his bride. Second coming, he comes with his bride. In the rapture, only his own will see him. You know, it's interesting. After his resurrection, he was only seen by loving eyes, and he was only touched by loving hands. You study the chronicle very carefully. It's very interesting. Apparently, in the rapture, too, only his own will see him. Second coming, every eye will see him and tremble. Rapture, generally, the great tribulation begins. Now, I want to be cautious about this. That's the way it's usually presented. Not necessarily at that instant. But the rapture triggers a series of events that, caught, that leads to the great tribulation. The second coming, the millennium begins. The rapture is the church believers only. Many scholars point out that the Old Testament saints will not be resurrected until after the millennium. That comes as a shock to many, but you can check Daniel 12 to check that out for yourself. So we see the marriage fulfilled, the covenant's been established, 1 Corinthians 11, the purchase price been paid, 1 Corinthians 6, bride's been set apart in all kinds of references. That's most of the New Testament is it admonitions to the bride to keep herself apart, preserved. We're reminded of the covenant again in 1 Corinthians 11. The bridegroom left for the father's house, and we're waiting for 1 Thessalonians 4. So in the next session, we'll take a break, but the next session I'm going to say pattern is prologue. We're going to take a look at strategic structure in the scripture, and uh, partly for a strategic perspective and partly for some surprises that uh, uh, you may find rather provocative. So uh, let's take a brief period. But as we do, as we do, I want you to be thinking about the invitation that Jesus has given to the bride. I go to prepare a place for you. Is he preparing a place for you? Is Jesus busy right now, tonight, Preparing a place for you. Are you certain of that? Because that's really what it's all about. And we'll talk more about that in the next session. Let's take a break.